Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to my channel. I hope you guys are doing great. Now I have a surprise for you right after the intro, so let's hit it and begin. <laughs> I am here with Richard uh, Richard Knack. Thank you very, very, very much for coming on board. I am a huge fan of your books. Well, your Dragonlance books. I'm sorry to say I haven't read a lot of your other material. Oh, well, I'm getting off her now, then. <laughs> <laughs> I promise that I will get to it eventually. I am working my way through Dragonlance. It's been three years, I think, that I've been reading, that I got back to reading Dragonlance. I've read close to 100 of the books, so I'm most of the way there. <laughs> there's a lot. Oh yeah, there's like 170 books I have, I think, something like that. Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman are the main timeline from my, from my point of, of view. Of course. You, on the other hand, not like a lot of other authors that don't take their timeline into account. Your books show how much you care about it, and the amount of detail you go into threading your books into everything. How do you do that? It's I don't know. I, I just always like to play in other people's worlds, so I try to, which is what I do with Dragonlance, and I just delve into it. I look for things that appeal to me, and I really and I focus on them, and I try to and I try to build out from there. And then basically, when I write, it seems one story begets another story. There's always something I've written in the, in, in the first story that I really wanted to go back to again in, in another story. And then that starts to grow other things, and uh, and that's how I end up with you know eleven books in the series, which a lot of them have minotaurs, for example. <laughs> yeah, I, I was interested to know where did your infatuation with minotaurs come from? Well, I was very heavily into mythology when I was younger, still am kind of, um, and uh, minotaurs I always found very fascinating. Uh, I just thought they were the neatest of the uh, we'll call them monsters, for lack of a better term. Um, I just always thought they were really interesting looking, um, and I remember one of the Ray Harryhausen flicks had a had a, uh, a metal minotaur in there, and that was something I thought was really cool. It was different than what you've seen. You know, you see the other the other creatures usually tended to see more of, but the minotaurs were more unique in my opinion, and I just kind of liked them. And when I read about the the crim minotaurs, I, I kept thinking there's a contradiction. They're like monsters in the early stuff. And yet they have a sophisticated empire. Yeah. So clearly they can't be monster monsters. They have to have unique personalities and cultures and all kinds of stuff like that. And, and once I got into that, it's like, oh, I'm going to use these guys. Especially since they talked about him having honor, even though technically they're supposed to be bad guys. As I, I was going to say, and so that that's since I really liked using honorable characters like knights, it just made sense. And and uh, that's why I started you know, mixing them into my other works with Dragonlance. You I kind of went off on a tangent there, I guess. <laughs> you turned them into something else. I, I'm not even talking about the blood, the Minotaur Wars because that no. series was incredible. I'm talking okay. the first, the first three essentially. The Legend of Huma that you left the knights behind, and from there you went with the Cause of the Minotaur and Land of the Minotaurs. The unofficial Chaos trilogy, yeah. Yeah, it was. I loved it. First of all, it's. I think also in the Legend of Uma, you talked about how the Minotaurs were slave uh, slave fighters for the Queen of Darkness. Uh, yeah, they were essentially fodder, but they were still yeah. evil. Yeah, and yet when you find Kaz, you see you know you know what you assume about any race is not always true. There's always good and bad ones and in different ones. <laughs> that is um, correct. And uh, if pre preceding that, I had written a story called Definitions of Honor which is the first time I used the knights and the minotaurs. Okay. And that was because I had to think about their, how their honor systems would contrast and complement one another. And I thought, I thought the story worked out really good, and people apparently thought so too. And that's one of the reasons I was able to come back and use uh, the Kaz in Huma, because this way I was able to really put the, 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 the comparison of honor systems uh, to work. To, to give a, a really different idea of how how you, you can have two characters with, with, who should be perfectly matched in terms of honor and yet aren't 
and the different decisions they make because of it. And their honor leads them in two completely different paths. Yeah, and yet it converges again at other points. The beautiful thing that you made it that you made it out to be is that the Minotaurs and the Knights respect each other. Mm-hmm. They may be mortal enemies, but they still respect the way the other acts. And to me, that's beautiful. It's it's like the later books with the Knights of Tachesis, where they also finally find their own honor. I was wondering, how did you get into writing? Oh, God, well, it just it just flowed. Um, I, I enjoyed, I started reading at a very early age, and I just enjoyed reading fantasy and science fiction and mystery especially. And um, the more I started to read, the more I read, the more I started making up my own stories often based on what I read, of course. It's... But then I started going off any inverted tangents when I, when I made up stories involving things I was interested in, you know, such as mythology and, dra- and dragons especially. We are. And it just, it, just, it just made sense for me to start trying to put down my stories. You know, first I tried to do them like in terms of comic books because that's why I was reading a lot of those too. And then I started, and then as I got older, I started doing full prose fiction uh, trying to write short stories whenever I could, and then uh, deciding I didn't like short stories because they were too short. <laughs> you can't tell a full story. And I start yeah, and um, start trying to write, write longer pieces, um, and just realized writing was what I want to do. Stories is what I want to do. Uh, I started as a chemical engineering major in college. Uh, became a chemistry major because I realized I didn't like physics, and then <laughs> and then and then, and then decided I didn't like chemistry anymore. <laughs> so, so I took my minor, which was which was writing, creative writing, rhetoric actually is what they called it there, um, and then made that my major because I was just like I have to do writing. I cannot get not do writing. And I am truly thankful you did. I told you, and I've said it uh, in different videos. Your books, your series are one of my favorites uh, that are not Margaret and Tracy's because. Sure because of the way it builds the world, but it never takes away from it. You don't contradict anything. You don't go overboard or clash with the with the main storyline. Is you're telling a story like in the Minotaur Wars, where they work together with Mina, and that is brought up a little bit in the, the War of the Souls. Yeah, but then you elaborate and you build on top of that. And to me, that's beautiful. I try to I try to make sure I, I fit in. The world properly. There are a couple. There are there were a couple of things that they you know told me that I needed to change. You know, for for various reasons from what had been known. You know, but uh, overall, you know, we try we try to make everything mesh. I mean, you have to build on what Margaret and Tracy have done because they are the foundation of Dragonlance. I mean, everything they put is is the gospel according to what I, when I'm writing. <laughs> you know, I'm just pleased. That, I'm just pleased that the books came out satisfactory to people. The way that you write it, it's now part of Crin's history. The elves are displaced because of your books. <laughs> <laughs> the evil laugh. <laughs> oh, the Minotaurs are just better, better with characters. That's all. That's all. They have to take over. They're more complex than the elves. And the beauty with the with the Minotaur Wars, you're writing a character. You're we are rooting for someone that is essentially evil, and yet not really. Exactly. Some, it's, it's just very, as I said, they're just very complex. Oh, they're, they're really bad ones. I mean, uh, Minotaur Warriors, you know, Lady Nefera. Oh, shoot, yeah. yeah. Like, <laughs> I'd call her my, my Minotaur Lady Macbeth, you know. She's a nasty one. Or Ardner, her son. Yeah, Ardner, um, I loved what you did with him at the end, that he turned yeah, into but, the monstrous uh, being. Yeah, but he, that was that just fit him perfectly. So, And then, of course, a, a a character who, who who's not a minotaur, who apparently uh, blossomed in the eyes of many readers, was the half ogre Golgrim. I love him. I, a lot of fans. <laughs> I just finished. I finished that series probably three or four months ago, and I loved it. It was very different, uh, even for what I did with the minotaurs. I mean, it was definitely an outgrowth of the minotaur wars. But I mean, Golgrim surprised me because he is very complex. You can see the dark side of him, but you can see the reasoning behind a lot of the things he does. He doesn't. There's really there's some legitimate reasons for some of the things he does, even if it if, even if it affects other characters, not in a good way. 
Exactly. Um, that's that's the reason why I like your characters because they may be evil, but the reason the reason the protagonists do stuff in your books is not out of evil or compulsion. It's out of calculation. They uh -huh. they have their vision. They have they know what they want to do, and they will achieve that. It can be good or evil. If I had to pick two characters that were fully my creation, as opposed to Huma, who had who was like ninety five percent my creation, uh, if I had to pick ones who are solely my creation, my two favorite would be Kaz and Goldrin. I also liked uh, Pharos. Was his name Pharos? Yeah, Pharos is very, very Pharos is very high up there. He's 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 like, he's toward like second tier toward the other two. Because he's um, very complex. The yes. what he went through in life. The slavery by his own people, the slavery by the ogres, the rebellions. Yeah. It built him up as a demigod. Yeah, he's uh, he's almost got that that he's almost got that Egyptian Egyptian feral sort of demigodness. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, like I said, oh, trust me, he's a very close. He's very close behind the other two. I just I just named my top two, <laughs> uh, but he's very close behind them. Yeah. Uh, like I said, Kaz and Goldrun. And Pharos is, is definitely uh, if Pharos is not third, then he's tied for third. I may be forgetting someone else right now, you know. But that's a uh, you know. But I'm talking about major, major, major characters that I created. So yeah, of course. They, I'm in the middle of reading Reavers of the Blood Sea. I'm in, oh, yeah, Eric's. Yeah. I wanted to finish this book before we did the interview, but I just didn't have time, sadly. Okay. I am. I am very pleased with the way I did Sargon Sargonus in that book. I wanted. To, I wanted, I thought I gave him more what he deserved in that book. He was very enigmatic, at least the most the part that I saw at the beginning. He is very enigmatic. He has his own thing, and whatever happens to his people is uh, besides the fact. I, and, I felt that he got some short short shrift in some other mentions, and and you get Carrie Joleth in there too. So that's it's like two sides of the same coin in some way. Yeah, both of them are fighting for... Both of them the are fighting... Of the Minotaurs. Exactly, and one of them is doing it honorable, and one of his, uh, them is doing it through <laughs> their through <laughs> their <laughs> anger. They're both doing it honorable, just different ways. I, Sargonis is honorable in his own way. That is, cur that is true. <laughs> Not necessarily the way some, a lot of us would consider it, but he has his own code. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing with the Minotaurs. Even though they have slaves, they run slaves all around the... Ancelon, mm. but they still have their on their code of honor. Oh yeah, definitely. And as you, and as you saw with Kaz and those who followed Kaz later on, you know they they, they can diverge greatly. The the Kazaledi. I love that. Part. I love that reveal. I just got to that reveal. They're boarding the ships now, and that yeah. blew me out of the water. When the when the ships that arrived were Minotaurs, and they were they were the descendants of Kaz. That was amazing. Thank you. There's, I, I really would like to get back to them again someday. I hope you get the chance. I hope Wizard of the Coast opens the doors back to Dragonlance. Well, I'm not going to hold my breath, but if they do, that would be nice. <laughs> how How is it to work, uh, to create something like this? Because the main storylines and the main books of Dragonlance are usually a group of champions that do something. You did not write anything like that. Do they, do they ask you, can you please write about Minotaurs, or do they say, we want a trilogy? Well, the first thing was, uh, way back I'd written the first, uh, I'd written short stories for the first trilogy, the Tales collections, mm -hmm. and uh, they saw how I handled the noble knights into the stories, you know, the, you know, the honor and sacrifice and all that, and so that for the first book they wanted from me, they asked me if I would do this, the true story of Huba. And um, who was a legend for the original characters? Yeah, they, they talk and so about that. It. So I, right away, I was given a, a, a book that was focusing on one character, which is fine. Actually, I don't mind working with groups. I mean, if you read my Rex Draconis, I have a lot of characters in there. But uh, this was a book that needed to focus on one character, but have other characters in it, obviously. Yeah. So I didn't. Mind, so that kind of gave made my focus with, with Dragonlance a lot more. I would concentrate on a particular character and build around them. Uh, for instance, you know, the Legend of Huma begat Kaz, and then Kaz got his own book, and I started building characters around him, 
many of whom came back in Land of the Minotaurs. And then, um, because it works so well with Kaz, when I did when I did uh, Reavers, I focused again on one character. Couldn't resist making him related mm-hmm. somehow. Yeah. Um, it was a perfect. It was. A... And, actually, and actually, the Minotaurs using a singular character actually I think works better too. Actually, with the, with with Ogre, the Ogres too, because um, while they will fight, while they're very much fighting groups, I just think that for for such a different sort of character, you need to focus on one in particular. I believe it's very hard to write about a nation. The, if, let's say, you take our world, for instance, so Alexander the Great, you don't write about Greece or Macedonia, you write about him. Yeah. The fact that now, he... Now, he now, shaped... I did do it a little bit differently when I got to Minotaur Wars, because that became writing about a nation in great parts. You gave us the entire history of the Minotaurs, how the society works. Yeah, and, and you know the, the the good parts and the parts that are really bad. <laughs> yeah, uh, that was fun, that was fun because I got to I got to add on to a, I had a lot of stuff in my head and and down paper about minotaurs, and I was finally able to get a lot get most of it on the written page. Finally, was that uh, a, was that a series that they asked you? Yeah. Yes, they actually asked me. They actually asked me uh, uh, if I would write since. The Minotaurs are becoming bigger players in the world, as we know. Mm-hmm. And they, and and of course, I had, I guess, established myself as the Minotaur Man. <laughs> uh, it's a good place to be. Yeah. And um, so they asked me, I think they suspected I had to be the one to do it. They asked me to, to write about all the intrigue going on in the Minotaur world. And um, we both, we all agreed that the first thing we had to do was get rid of the old emperor. Yeah, Kuth was uh, lazy. He, he was jaded and over the hill, and he was you know, he was a fake champion even. You know that's how bad he was. Mm. And you know, so you get you get the, at the beginning, you get the feel like, oh look, here's a guy who wants to bring the Minotaurs back to their their traditional ways. He was uh, working towards that. Yeah, uh, you know, uh, Hotek, okay. General Hotek. Yeah, uh, but unfortunately, General Hotek had had an interesting family. Very interesting uh, wife. Yeah, and also also uh, we had Pharaohs to deal with, who was related to the old emperor. In that, like I said, in this way, I was able to bring about all kinds of uh, introductions of, you know, this is how the empire runs this. This is how the empire runs this. This is Minotaur society as a whole, and then start throwing in things about, oh look, here's some interesting tidbits about what's going on with the ogres. And that was incredible. They you combined the two worlds that. They hated slavery so much, but as their ma- biggest punishment, it's not death, it's not banishment, it's selling, it's selling your people to the ogres. That's their biggest punishment. That's amazing. Yeah, there was a hypocrisy going on, of course, yes. <laughs> yeah, the fact that that's their biggest capital punishment, because death is death. But yeah, here... This, yeah, this is, this is dishonor. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Completely dishonor. worse. And it was nice how now I'm reading now when I'm reading the uh, Reavers, I meet Hotak for the first time. I uh, know, not Reavers. See, Reavers is before Hotak. Isn't it Hotak there? No, no. Hotak is is, is first met in Night of Blood. Reavers is all mostly about Eris. Eric, right. uh, he's he's uh, Eric's right. dragon. Right. I think, yeah. So who is the general there? I can't remember his name. I thought it was Hotak. Oh, I, think, I can't remember the general's name either. That's been so long. Well, I'm, I'm generally pretty good, but, but when it's been like 20 years or so, then I start losing track of certain books. Uh, yeah, that <laughs> time will do it. Time will do very, very vicious things to us. I had a great time uh, with Crin. Um, I was in almost every anthology too, which was nice. I like yeah. Your short stories are very, very nice. They're your writing is concise and to the point. You give the details that we need. But you don't fluff it up too much. I was say, I think you need to leave something to the imagination. Sometimes you get so much detail from somebody. It's nice; it gives you a vivid picture, but it might not be the vivid picture exactly as I want to see it. You know. Also, awesome. I think you. I think you need to, you know, tell you know, give what's needed and go on. I sometimes carry away myself. I admit, <laughs> but for the most part, I try to just give you what you need, and that's it. Yeah, for me, it's a bit difficult when it ha- when you have. 15 pages of uh, how the garden looks and that buildings. 
if if it doesn't drive the story forward, it should be there, or, but not that much. Like Tolkien. Or when I was reading an old James Bond book, and they and they just they took two pages to describe the meal, and to let you know, to let you know that James Bond really understood food and wine. Because the and food... a fine wine uh, made that was that had been done in 1922 or something, but it's like this. I mean, two pages just to describe the meal, basically. You can go on about stuff, but there has to be a limit, I guess. With the legend, as you know, some of my short stories I also deal with minotaurs a lot there too. You have the Kaz and the uh, the dragon eggs. Yeah, Kaz and the Dragon's Children it was called. Dragon that's the, yeah, that's the yeah, that's the one Kaz short story. Um, so basically, he appears three three books in one story, and then uh, I have miscellaneous minotaurs appearing throughout different times, and uh, and actually one story that's kind of tied into the. Um, to the uh, Reavers, which is uh, which is the Sword of Tears story, where you get to find you get to, you see what else has happened with that sword that Sargonus made. I haven't read that one. Yeah, it, and it's just it's basically called Sword of Tears. Okay. Uh, I think it's I think it's in the, the I think it's in the Relics and Almonds book if I'm remembering correctly. Uh, I've looked that up. So, but um, that was that was one of the, I like making evil magical swords. <laughs> <laughs> it's. It's another character to the book. It oh, adds yeah. a lot. It adds a lot to it. You know, well, the, the Sword of Tears had only one scene uh, in, the, uh, in the Legend of Huma, but I thought it made a, a pretty good uh, showing of it in that one scene. The Sword it's of involved, Tears was it involved Wormfather too. You know, the Sword of Tears appeared in the Legend of Huma. Oh yeah, that's the sword that that, uh, that Huma finds while he's while he's trying to get away from Wormfather. Really. Yeah, I completely forgot about that part. And the gray man comes and takes it away after this. I completely forgot about that. Oh yeah, Sword of Tears shows up there. Uh, shows up in the short story, Sword of Tears, and you can see what kind of havoc it's making. Uh, and then it also shows up in Reavers, where Sargonis wields it. Yeah, and he gives it to Ariox or Eryx. Eryx, yeah. Yeah, who ends up getting a, a better weapon from his, his ancestor. He gets, to have that, he gets to have that, that, that peel off of, of Honor's face. Yeah, I'm not there yet. So. Um, so, well, <laughs> it, won't, it, won't, it won't ruin the story for you. <laughs> I appreciate that. But Honor's face is an amazing weapon to itself. They Yeah, a lot of people ask about it. I know that people, they, they ask me about the stats on I don't have any personally, but um, I do know that there were some on the Dragon's Nexus or somewhere that some people made at times. Or um, I don't necessarily know if it would be entirely accurate but at least if anybody is looking for stats they have been made before a few years ago when i was getting back into D and playing i played a a campaign in dungeon world that it's a simplistic way of playing D, I guess and i crafted a sword based off of honor's face that it, oh, cool. that it has the returning a property and the transmutation that you could change it from a sword to any other weapon you need while you're using it. Because that blew my mind when it turned from an axe into a dragon lance. Well, it was, it was a very special moment for it. And uh, because of how it's been fashioned, basically, that was one of its, the deaths was one of the reasons it had been fashioned. Was it being fashioned out of a dragon steel? I cannot exactly tell you. I know that I, I, I said something specific about it somewhere, but I can't tell you right now. I, I just I'm Too blocking long. out to be honest. That was that book was published thirty. Well, it's coming up on. Oh, it's almost it's almost the thirty fourth anniversary of Legend of Yuma. Nineteen eighty nine, right? Eighty eight. Eighty eight. Yeah. Yeah, which means it was written basically in eighty seven. That means that it was written when I was born and published a year after. Well, thanks a lot. Not really. Feel like <laughs> I'm sorry about that. <laughs> That was my first published novel. I was uh, when that came out. I was still let's see. I was eighty-eight. I was still twenty-six when that came out. I became twenty-seven a couple months later. That's incredible. Uh, That's an incredible achievement. I already had my three short stories with Dragonlance uh, when I sold when I was twenty-five. I like the way you did Huma. That he was not a true hero. He was flawed in so many ways. He that, just did what he knew was right, even if it cost him. And he wasn't perfect. 
No, because you know I, I've seen characters where I, I am so and so God killer. You know, I'm like fear, fear me. I'm like, yeah, but I'd rather have a character who who has to try harder. Characters like that are boring and unrelatable. Yeah. When you're reading a book, you you need to relate to your protagonist or antagonist. It doesn't matter. You have to relate to the main characters. When one of yeah. them is a god, how can how can we mere mortals relate to them? Well, see, that's the thing. I thought by being so human, like a human, I thought that that would make him a better hero. I, I wholeheartedly agree with that. And also the beauty with it is 3,000 years later, they're talking about the, this legendary knight. And when you read the legend of Huma, of Huma, you understand that he wasn't. He did what he thought was right, and he pushed himself far beyond what a normal human should have. And that makes him even more admirable. Yeah. And at the end of the day, <clears throat> the fact that he gave up his love with uh, with hope to join to rejoin the war means a lot. It shows exactly. his dedication. Yeah. I'm really pleased how the book turned out, believe me. Um, I was only given one volume to work with. So I could have written a trilogy of him. But uh, so I so I took the story where I had to take it uh, in order to get what I wanted out there. Um, it was longer. I had to edit out some stuff because of uh, length considerations. But I believe it still reads very well. And, and it seems like the vast majority of people have really enjoyed it, which I'm very grateful for. Hopefully someday it'll be back in paper. Hmm. I'm, <laughs> I know you can get it on ebook and, and, and audio, but I, I, I know a lot of people like paper. Myself, I really like paper too. So I hope you will... I mean, I'll cross my fingers someday we'll get it back to that again. I love paper. I love owning paper books, but 95% of my reading I do on my Kindle because it's just a lot more convenient. And uh, that's one reason why they have put in paper. <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> uh, but there's, I, I, I guarantee you, there's, they could do, it would sell very well if they put it back in paper. Uh, Any Dragonlance. They, in the past... Three, four years, the Dragonlance fandom exploded a lot more. I've noticed that. There is a three big groups on Facebook now. A, when COVID started two years ago, give or take, something like that, I was working from home a lot, so I had a lot of spare time, and I watched a lot of videos on YouTube about the D&D and Forgotten Realms. There was nothing about Dragonlance. No. Well, we almost have like four big groups now, I mean, because uh, we have... Dragonlance, we have Dragonlance Fandom, uh, Sages of Dragonlance, those are the ones I deal with, so I think those are the biggest ones. Yeah. And then Dragonlance Book Club is getting a pretty large size, too. It's, I know it's, uh, uh, it's, I thought it's at least 1,700 people, I think. And then there's a couple smaller ones that are starting to build up, too. But we, uh, I'd say, I'd say we, we pretty much have like at least four major ones, and then some other ones um, that I may not know of. <laughs> I'm sure there are a lot of smaller, uh, smaller book uh, book clubs, but the fact that there is now apparently four very big, uh, prominent pages that are sol solely and ho all heartedly dedicated to one world, and it's a yeah. world that I love. It's so much fun to discuss this stuff with people. And I get a lot of people who uh, who seek me out because they want to tell me how much they enjoyed Legend of Humor and Kaz, especially. Uh, which is really nice, and then they tell me that they they've gotten their children to enjoy it, you know, the which makes me old but happy. <laughs> <laughs> the fact that you interact with people is incredible to me. You're uh, you're sure a busy person, but well, you... yeah, but this 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 is. I mean, I was a fan before I was a writer, you know, so, and so I, I enjoy that, you know, and as um, long as people can put up with me coming in there, I would I appreciate that. Um, I'll try to answer questions, you know, if people ask them, but, you know, I can't always do that. But uh, I, I really appreciate that they enjoyed my work. You've done fantastic work. It, it, it's fun speaking with someone that actually built the world because you have a completely different perspective than two fanboys just uh, geeking out about it. Well, I don't know if I just sort of built the world, but I really expanded on, on certain parts of it. The Minotaurs and the Ogres were Minotaurs, ogres, foot, and were some of the historic and some of the historical aspects with the time of Huma and such. So yeah, I'll, I'll definitely lay claim to the to the Minotaurs and I'm, even some of the Ogre stuff. Definitely, I tried to throw a few gargoyle things in there too. <laughs> the gargoyle king was amazing. I enjoyed him. His 
sinister motives I didn't understand so much. He essentially wanted... Did he want the uh, the fire he removal tried, for himself? Or did he want it to restore the ogres? Or He was trying to restore, basically, the past in his, in his own taste, actually. All of them were doing um, the same thing, then. Uh, the, the, ogre, the Ogre Titans trilogy is, is a very uh, different one for me. Uh, there's a lot of things that in there. I was actually just things using that trilogy, and also to build on different directions, and also the unexpected popularity of Goldrun hmm. uh, obviously made him a, a proper choice as a catalyst for all this. We had met him earlier in a short story under a different name. Okay, uh, which one is that? Oh, I can't remember that anymore. I, I shouldn't have said that. No, uh, I believe that, but uh, there's a, there's a story where some knights. You meet a half ogre who. Ah, they him train him. Standard. Yeah, they, and that's actually Goldrun under a different name. They, there's re, you find out the reason for that difference in naming in the Ogre Titans trilogy. If you go back and read the. Read yes, he changes his name. That he is the chieftain or the chieftain's son, and he yeah. outmaneuvers both the Solomnic and the Knights of Takesis. Yes. And um, and you find out that in some ways he's been manipulated as well in in the trilogy. Yeah, completely. Until he understands that he is being manipulated. Yes, and then that's the worst thing. When when Goldrun finds out that he's been he's been made a fool of in his eyes, you have to watch out for him. Then, you know. <laughs> because he prides himself on his smarts. Oh yeah. And yeah. he prides himself on how that he manipulates people. And then to exactly. find out, it's like the saying, a, the best con is to con a con man. Yeah. I mean, he was obviously a manipulator even in the Minotaur Wars. Yeah, definitely. He was a very uh, prominent uh, figure in there. To be honest, the Minotaur Wars is really a lot. I got the, the Ogre Titans. I mean, basically, the first thing that was mentioned was that Golgan was going to be the focus. <laughs> I could understand that because... He was a powerhouse. Yeah. And writing, about, Go on. writing a book about ogres should be difficult because essentially they're not smart. Right? No, yeah, they got they got a brutish intelligence. He, um, but, yeah, and that yeah. it's difficult to write a book on so, on someone like like that. Yeah, and that's why that's why I had to explain it. What is it about this guy? Why is he different? What, you know, is he really a half ogre? Just you know, so you learn that it's magical the way he yeah. is. It's, uh, I guess we need to put disclaimers for it. Warning, there are, there are things you might hear. They may, there may be a few, uh, what are they called? Spoilers. That's the word. Yes. But, but that's too bad. It's too bad. The book's not long enough. The books have been out since 2013, I think, the Ogre Titans. Oh, God, no. It's been longer than that, I think. It's, uh, boy. Uh, 2009, I'm sorry. I thought so. I thought it was longer. Yeah. That was uh, some of the last. That was the last stuff I did. I really it was hope, fun. I, I would like to see your take on Taladas, because mm-hmm. okay. the ogres there work with humans. They're a lot more towards Kirijulith, that kind of side. Where's the fun with that? I want to. There's lots to do with. There's lots to do with Goldberg. <laughs> well, he wasn't done. We purposely left it so he wasn't done. Yeah, what's happening behind the walls? That's for that was supposed to be for her, okay, a future possibility. Remember, we still have Pharaohs running the Empire, and we have Goldrun running the Ogres. There's a lot to go on with both of those guys. And you have the elves that they will fight they tooth and nail to get back. We're just gonna we're just gonna tromp all over them. <laughs> and the Minotaur shall rule. An elven nation when they when they are exiled from their from their lands and they try to get back. And the Minotaurs destroy them. They yeah, send. Yeah, wasn't that nice? They send out uh, the talons, and they bring. They build them up uh, like fingers, sharp fingers, and they just drive through the elves. That made oh, me yeah, really they, sad. <laughs> the Minotaurs have been planning for a long time. They they, they were not going to be anybody's foot soldiers anymore. Oh yeah. That's 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 what that was all about. And it comes to show how much the humans dismiss them. Mm-hmm. I yeah, I've enjoyed them so much. I mean, um, obviously, since I can't write in um, that world anymore, at least for now, um, that's why I uh, went to, uh, in part, why I created my Rex Draconis saga. 
which is very, for those who like Dragonlance, it's very influenced by the Dragonlance Interesting. Uh, writing that I did. Are uh, those... that mentors take I have, I have a big part in there. There's a whole empire there. A little bit different than the one you know from Dragonlance. So they got their own things, including, including if you think Minotaur's are bullying, so you see a, the equivalent of a Minotaur samurai. You know, that just, sounds like cool. Oh, there it is. Yeah, very, very honor bound. <laughs> so, uh, uh, one of my, that's one of my mentors like that. I've got three brothers who are Minotaur, three Minotaur brothers in this saga that you, read, you start reading. One's uh, basically a mariner. The one's a samurai. And I'm not going to tell you about the third one because he's got real problems. I will get to your books. They, I already bought them from Amazon. They're just waiting for me to finish Dragonlance. At right, I it. right now, I put everything aside and I'm trying to finish all of the Dragonlance books, at least all of the books by the authors that I enjoy reading. Well, I appreciate that I'm one of those. You are at the top of that list. Uh, and you know, I just you know, I just literally came in off the street to, to TSR, the original publisher. It's funny how it seems that all of the major players that created Dragonlance this, it's the same thing. Oh, I literally walked in off the street. Ah, you just writing samples. You literally them. opened the door and walked in and gave them your writing samples. Yes, I was. I lived in Chicago and they were in Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. So I drove up there with with samples of two novels I've written and asked if I could talk to the book to the editors. And right. after they got over the fact that somebody had just walked in to do that, they contacted the book editor and he came out and I told him what who I was and I. And offered the writing samples, and he took them. And he said, "If I didn't hear anything in a couple of weeks, to give to give a call." Well, I didn't hear anything in a couple of weeks, so I assumed the worst. But I called anyway, and he, I think that was just a test on his part. And uh, he said that they they really liked what they'd seen. Uh, they were only publishing these series right now. Was a but based on on this one book especially, uh, Fire Drake. Would I be interested in submitting some short story ideas to these anthologies that they were putting together for Dragonlance? And I said sure, and I went home and I, and I, I quickly picked up all the Dragonlance novels that were available. I think I think uh, at that point they had just gotten into the Legends trilogy, read through them, and really got into them and, and, and had ideas sparking. Uh, and so I submitted a total of four ideas, and they bought three of them. Nice. And I want for each anthology. You know. Very and by nice. the way, the, the first, well, that book that they liked so much that they, they couldn't publish, Fire Drake, that became the first book of my own Dragon Realm saga. But the fact that you walked off, you literally came out the street, knocked on their door, and gave them your publishing, your your book, that that's so much uh, faith in your, in your work and in yourself. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, I, I was raised to be very stubborn. <laughs> <laughs> like a minotaur. <laughs> I, I think that's probably why I appreciate them. You know. I, but, uh, I, I, will, I, I just enjoy using them. So. But uh, yeah, that's how I got started with them. How is it working with them? If that's uh, okay to ask. I mean, writing, mm-hmm. because you're writing characters in a world that is not yours. Yeah, but I've done a lot of that. I mean, I started with Draglance, but I've, I've written for Warcraft and Diablo, Conan, Pathfinder, and others. Um, so I enjoy I just enjoy it being in other people's world. I'll, I'll, I'll stay true to the world unless they've asked me to change something, which they all seem to have. But um, I, I just, I, I like, I don't want, if I, I like getting those, especially if they've got a lot going on for them. Um, there was a lot of history and stuff already with the, with Kryn. Oh yeah. Um, and, and uh, also in the worlds of uh, for the world for all the Blizzard worlds and such. Uh, it's just um, it, it's great to immerse myself in other people's worlds. Uh, and as long as they allow me to uh, to add something and not just you know verbatim do what they already have, then that makes it even better. Um, and they all seem to appreciate it. They all want me to add my touch to it. Uh, oh, uh, when I, the reason I was able to get into the Blizzard series was because several of the original founders of Blizzard had grown up on my Dragonlance work. <laughs> yeah. So I was, yeah, especially Lesser Huma. So I was basically raising my own employers at that point. 
essentially yeah, so. is. Well, but, uh, that was a lot of fun there too because of that. You have been writing for so long that you inspired multiple generations. Yeah, 30, what is it? Yeah, it's coming up on 35 years published. So there are uh, at least, if the young adults that read it when you published your books, they are parents and maybe even grandparents by now. Well, yes. Not, sadly, many of them are grandparents already, yes. <laughs> You could touch you. You have touched three generations, and that's that's incredible. I've also picked out a few people from the previous generation, the older readers too. So, so I'm, I'm touching uh, three generations down, and at least one, even two, upward. I think it was Caesar who said that a man dies twice: once when he dies, and the other when your name is forgotten. Well, I'm begging everybody to keep remembering my name, if only in vain. <laughs> Isn't that the best kind of way? <laughs> if you had the option to continue writing in Dragonlance, what would be your vision for the for the ogres and for the Minotaurs? I really want to want to discuss that because it someday may come. Okay. I do obviously want to show more of what's happening with the Minotaurs as they uh, become entrenched in, on the main continent. Yeah, they destroyed uh, the would, forest. I would like to also show what the Casaletti are doing. That really intrigues me. That would definitely, that is definitely even a, in some ways a bigger thing for me because I want to show the mark that Kaz and his and his kind had on the generations afterward, and um, the differences between them and the Empire. I mentioned the similarities too, in some ways. While Minotaurs are good about their Minotaurs, this doesn't mean they're going to be allies under certain circumstances. Yeah, so even though that Minotaurs are good, they're still Minotaurs and they will not trust or like humans or elves. Except that the Kazaleti might be more willing to ally themselves with Salamia, for instance. That would make sense because if the regular Minotaur Empire really respects the Salamnic Knights, so the, the, the Kaz descendants will be a lot more intrigued with working with them because they'll see they'll see a bondhood and if if the, if the empire becomes comes in conflict with salamia the the, the Kazaleti will have a lot of decisions to make if they will even interfere as they are, well if they interfere or if they do interfere how will they do it i mean could you know because the Kazaleti are minotaurs who are not not afraid of being behind the scenes in certain cases that's what you wrote in the Reavers, that they have yeah. been uh, quietly observing and manipulating when they needed. Yeah. And it's, it's like, so basically, they would probably be one of the biggest things I'd want to write about. Plus, there's things I'd like to write about back in humanist time. For instance, I never really got to tell Magus' story, and I do believe a lot of people would like to see it. I would love to see that. In fact, because you would find out that some things are not necessarily as you know, and that uh, Magus... He, uh, is, a lot, is he more cunning than he thought he was? He was supposed to be one of the most powerful mages out there. And I would, and and the story that I would write on, which would show a lot more of that too. Uh, unfortunately, I was limited for space, as I said. I could use a trilogy, but I had one book, you know. So um, yeah, <laughs> and I even had to pare that down for size. And he doesn't get a lot of screen time. No, because uh, in some ways, Kaz demanded to be there too so and i think that actually worked out for the best but i hope to do more with magis later on but no, but that nothing came of that i think that it worked out to the best as well because huma was a martial character yeah and having a martial ally beside him made a lot more sense than uh, than magus yeah now of course i also would like to do i wouldn't mind to do more books with kaz himself because he, he, there's, he certainly is a character who would have a lot of adventures still going on. His adventures down south, for instance. Yeah. Adventures after Land of the Minotaurs and even possibly a couple previous to that, depending what they're involving. I was talking about previous uh, because in, uh, in Cause of the Minotaur, he talks about how he went down south and he went up north. Mm -hmm, exactly. 
and and when and uh, some of the stuff he did when he first met Delvin or even before Delvin. The only thing we ever get a clue of is is Kaz and the Dragon's children. That's the only. That's the only. I mean, that's until shortly after Legend of Yuma. Mm-hmm. So that's the only thing from his earlier times that we get. Then you know, then we have Kaz and then Land of the Minotaurs. We have, um, so there's a lot of space to write about Kaz. And it might be interesting to delve a little bit more into Renard some way. I don't know. Renard would be amazing, yeah, uh, to see how he met Morgan, how yeah. he turned into a plague knight. Yeah, his downfall. His, Renard's Renard's fall from grace would have been that would have been at least a really good short story, I think. I mean, he was a knight of Solomnia. How did he get corrupted? Desperation, a lack of uh, a losing of faith, praying for something and not getting it from the God he expected it to, and instead getting it from the God who demanded something terrible from him. I was going to say, but at the point where he was willing to agree to that. Desperation leads a man to do very stupid things. Yes, and, but you see it, you see in the end in Huma that he regrets his decisions. Yeah, and he stops the plague. Yeah, and uh, sacrifices himself for it. So There's a lot. Um, there is and then a ghost story I bring in. You know? There is a lot of that going around. Yeah. People sacrificing themselves for their either mistakes or to save others. And then his ghost shows up during the cataclysm. That is true. Yeah, I didn't know they were going to have a Lord Soft story in the same volume. I, I, I told him, I'm going to write the, I like to write a ghost story with Renard. And I go, okay. So I write this story and then I find out, oh, you mean there's a Lord Soft story in there too? Thanks a lot. <laughs> I've only got my minor death night, thank you. Lord Soth is. Is a staple, I'd say. Yeah. Not only for Dragonlance, but for fantasy as a whole. Oh, yeah. His presence is so, on the one hand, evil, but on the other, tragic, that you kind yeah. of root for him. Yeah. I will say one thing. Um, Kaz has made a bit of his mark, I think, on fantasy also, because I have noticed far more use of Minotaurs as characters and such in fantasy. I mean, they were used one now and then before that, but after Kaz, it seems like there are far more use of Minotaurs in fantasy fiction than there, than there was before that. And uh, Theros Ironfell. When he but not just in Dragonlance, but yes. Um, when you learn but I mean, I mean, I mean, in other books I've just seen from different writers over the years. I'll, I haven't seen a lot of about uh, Minotaurs. If we are uh, they also show up in a lot of games, too. Games, that is correct, because they're awesome to look at. Yeah. But, I mean, so a lot of times you can play them now, too, which is interesting. They're not just monsters. Sadly, in D&D, I don't think they are a playable race. Well, that's that, right? That's D&D. Yeah. What is your thoughts about modern D&D, if I could ask? I have no thoughts on it at all. Um, I, I, I stay neutral on that. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> it's sad because you created, you helped create the original D and D. I wrote stories, and I wrote stories for Dragonlance, and some of my stuff because of that shows up in gaming material. That's all. I wrote background. I wrote uh, background material for Dragonlance related stuff. For instance, about the tours, obviously. Uh, which people have used in their games, but no, I would, I would not give myself that. No, I, I'm, I'm basically a writer whose contributions have ended up in gaming stuff. As footnotes. As footnotes, as uh, new, new parts of updated editions. You know, if there's anything out there that I did that shows up in a game that you know that's, I guess, uh, that's an honor, I guess. You have a lot of content in a, in a, the Dragonlands campaign setting. When they oh, play. yeah, I would guess so, that. Yeah. Um, especially if you're going to play in that time period with Kaz and Ilmar. Um, yeah. yeah. Especially if they, go, if they got newer stuff with the, with the modern empire, too. So, but yeah. Uh, but I, like I said, most of the, uh, the, the gaming st- I mean, I, I, did the, I did the material in terms of the novels, and most of the gaming stuff was, was done by... Uh, in great part by other people. I mean, I contributed a few things, but not much. You got to touch, yeah, and you got to create something in a world that, at least for me, it uh, mm-hmm. 
it changed my uh, my youth. It gave me a way to dream and see something out of the world that I lived in. And I uh, appreciate that. Glad for whatever part I played. I started with Dragonlance and then moved on to David Eddings and other authors. But Dragonlance was my uh, was my core. I stopped reading altogether uh, for at least a decade. And then about three or four years ago, my friend Alex, the guy that I was living with at the time, uh, I was looking for something to read because I'm working on board ships and I'm getting bored from TV shows. So he tells me, here, take. The books that he gave me were, were The War of the Souls and Minotaur Wars. And he said that those were... Minotaur Wars is his, one of his favorite uh, uh, trilogies as well. And that's the main factor that brought me back to Dragonlance. Well, I appreciate that for both of you. <laughs> uh, I do want to thank you for coming on board. Not at all. Um, uh, I'm glad you've been here. I... Glad you enjoyed my stuff, both the stuff that's uh, Dragonlance, and uh, I know you got the stuff that uh, Hyda Publications puts out, the Rex Draconis stuff, so I I'm, I'm, uh, hope you enjoy that when you get to it eventually. When I get to um, them, I will have you on board again, just to talk about those books. Sounds good. Uh, I, I appreciate you having me in general on this. Um, I hope people enjoy what I've said. Um, Thank you for being so interactive with your fans. The fact that you answer comments on Facebook pages is amazing. That people ask questions and then the actual author of the book answers the question blows my mind because 20 years ago, to get something like that, you will have to go to a book signing in the middle of a different city or wait for you to come to our city for a book signing that we could ask you a question. Well, I can't promise... Um... I'll answer all questions, but I do at least try to, uh, to, to let people know. Um, I appreciate that people have enjoyed my work for so long. I've got all these stories I want to tell, and I want to keep telling stories. And we can't, we can't wait to get more. And I really pray that one day you will be able to get back to Dragonlance and uh, tell us more stories and what happens with the orgs, for instance. It would be nice to get back to doing some of that stuff. Um, hopefully, maybe it'll last me someday. Uh, like I said, I'm not going to hold my breath. In the meantime, I'll just work on uh, Rex Draconis and Dragon Realm and my other projects. I am hoping that after the, the trilogy by Margaret and Tracy is going to come out shortly, in a year or so, I hope that after that trilogy is going to come out, Wizards are going to understand how much uh, how much people love this world, and they'll start bringing back uh, authors and publishing more stuff about it. Let's hope they realize that after the first book comes out, because be, otherwise you have to wait two or three more years before the last one comes out. Yeah, I hate that. <laughs> I do not have the the patience to sit and wait for a book for two years. And we we writers from Israel Draglands, we're all getting older, you know. That is a hundred percent correct. I almost didn't make it to this year. <laughs> I wish you many, many more years of, uh, of health and joy and providing the world with more of your stories. Thank you very much. Again, thanks for having me. Have a lovely evening. Thank you very much for coming, Richard. I appreciate it. You too. Bye. Bye-bye. And that was the interview with Richard. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Mr. Knack was incredible. I really, really love his books. The fact that he writes about the evil races and not heroes and saving the world really gives you a different perspective about the world of Dragonlance and how evil does win from time to time. And when they do, it may not be as bad as you think. So I hope you guys enjoyed this interview and we'll see you in the next video. Have a great day.